Well, I've known Jester for 25 years, and I met him the first time in Ogden when two of my friends who were choral directors in Ogden, uh, Joe Graves and Dale Blackburn, had him with their choirs doing a workshop. And they invited me, and my wife and I went, met Jester for the first time, and then a year or two later he was at Utah State. And I met him again there and, and was so impressed by him as an individual and also his uh, knowledge and understanding of the spiritual and how he can work with children, young people, that I thought the good thing to do, a, a good thing to do would be to have him come and work with my choir at Skyline and with other choirs in the Granite School District and that's how it all came about. What were your first impressions? Just, just, Not a, sure. just a second. Um, yeah, I bet you could get in a little closer. You want to extend that? You can rest it on your shoulder. Or do a little bit of that. Okay. Once again, your first impressions of Jester. You want to go back to where I first met him? Sure. sure. Well, I've known Jester for 25 years, and the first time I met him was in the late 60s when two good friends of mine who are choral directors in Ogden, Dale Blackburn at Ogden High School and Joe Graves at Weber High School, invited Jester to come and do a choral workshop with their choirs. And they invited me to come, and my wife and I went and met Jester, and were very impressed by him as an individual, uh, aside from all the wonderful things he had done with black spirituals and with, with young people as he worked with them in choirs. And then a year or two later, he was at Utah State. And we again went there to see him and decided that it would be a good thing to invite him to Granite School District and to work with the high school choirs in Granite School District. I was teaching at Skyline High School at the time. And that's where we first came across him, and that's how this whole thing developed. Okay. What would you say were your first impressions? The first impressions were exactly like they are now. The man is a great human being. He's a humanitarian, he loves people, and if you understand his life and know his life, and look back in the 60s when there was so much bitterness and conflict, uh, you'd think that maybe here was a man who would have some reason to be bitter, but never was there any rancor or bitterness in anything that he ever did. His whole purpose was to bring people together, to work with people. As far as Jester is concerned, we're all children of God. We're all brothers, and he treats people that way. And I guess that's the thing that impressed me when I first met him, but it still does. It hasn't changed. Good, good, real nice. What do you think makes him different as far as comparing him from one conductor to another? Probably because he lives the music that he uses, the spirituals. His family was a plantation family, and he remembers this from his boyhood. His grandparents were slaves. Those stories he's heard from them, uh, and he's part of it. That's, that's part of his life. And when he gets in front of a choir, that shows. Because he's lived it, he can tell them the stories of how the spirituals came to be, and it makes sense to the people who are singing them. And that's why he can make almost any choir sound like it's a black choir. Good. Do you think you'll have any challenges with the Jester, he doesn't have challenges with anyone. Good. Um, what, what piece of music do you like most that he has done? Well, I don't have any favorites among those that he's done, but uh, the piece that probably was used by high school choirs in the 60s that, that really made a reputation for Jester among those choral directors was Elijah Rock. And we're going to be singing that Sunday, not on the broadcast, but on the concert after the broadcast. And that's one that probably every high school choir has sung. Good. Let's do that again, and let's not say we're going to be singing, but maybe package that in a different oh. way so that, yeah. Where do I start? Um, uh, maybe the one that he, the piece that he's the most famous okay. for. The piece that probably uh, reached more people or more choral directors and choirs early on was his arrangement of Elijah Rock. And it's uh, just a, a fun arrangement and it's wonderful to sing and that's the one that I think he became known for very quickly. And then he's arranged literally hundreds of others and composed them too. Good. All right, let's stop taking, check playback for
Yes. Uh, our family moved to Wisconsin in 1970, and uh, I taught at the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. And one of my assignments was a high school and junior high school music clinic in the summer. And one of the summers, I invited Jester to be the guest conductor for the choral groups, and I invited Vaslav Nelibel, who was a well-known composer, particularly of instrumental music, to be the guest conductor for the bands. And Vaslav has quite a reputation for being a tyrant. And I went into one of his rehearsals with the band, and he was just being the tyrant. I mean, he was yelling at the percussionist, and he was just up and down, and someone wouldn't do what he wanted them to, and he'd run down in front of them and shake his fist at them, and it was, you could see the kids being intimidated by it. And at the meantime, in another building, Jester was working with the 200 voice choir. And so when uh, Mr. Nellibel got through, I said, would you like to go watch Jester Harrison work? He said, yes, I would. So we went and watched Jester work with this 200 voice choir for at least a half hour, maybe 40 minutes. And when he got through, Vaslav turned to me and he said, he didn't yell at them once. And I said, imagine that. And he got the point. His rehearsals from that point on were very different than they were to begin with. And while we were still in Wisconsin um, that year that Jester was there, he was in our home a number of times and he would sit on the couch and our kids would all sit at his feet and he would tell them story after story about the slaves and the plantations and I think the younger kids thought he was their grandfather. But uh, our 19 year old boy, uh, he was not 19 at the time, but a couple of years later he turned 19, Curtis, and was called to serve the church on a mission in England. And uh, Jester called from California and he said, Don, he said, uh, where is Curtis now? And I said, well, he's in London on a mission for the church. Well, he said, I'm going to go to Africa for the State Department. And he said, uh, can you give me a telephone number where I can reach Curtis? I'll call him. I have a stopover in London. And so he did. He flew to London and he called Curtis and visited with him. And that's just the kind of a person he is. And that's why he is so effective as an ambassador for the State Department. That's why he's so effective as he works with choirs. It doesn't matter whether it's the Tabernacle Choir or whether it's a small high school choir. That's just the way he is. And he just makes everyone feel at home and they love what he does and they love working with him. And you can watch it in their eyes, you can see it in their eyes, and you can watch an audience. You watch the audience as, as he works and, and they become totally involved too. He's just a great human being. Well, when you start talking about... Uh, okay. When you start talking about the history of the spiritual and those who have made it known in the choral world, you start with the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, you talk about people like... Um, it's just the executive producer. I didn't hear anything. He's got to get on tape somewhere, right? He never gets on any of your shows, so... Yeah. We're rolling and when you talk about the history of, of the spiritual, you have to talk about the Fisk Jubilee singers who did a wonderful job of bringing it to the to the uh, forefront so people would know what it was. Then you have to talk about H. T. Burley and Hall Johnson, William A. Dawson, and then comes Jester. He just follows in this line, and he has done the very same kind of thing that they have. He is the leader, and there are others who are springing up now who are following in that same tradition. But Jester is one of those, and he probably has arranged hundreds of spirituals. I don't know how many, but they come right out of his background. He understands them. Uh, his family history lived them, and they passed that on to him, and this is what makes him so good at what he does. That and the fact that he has had a fine musical education too. How was he perceived from the, in the outside world by the musician? As the leader in the... You rephrase my question and incorporate it in your answer. He's perceived in the choral world right now as the leader in his area of black spirituals. Uh, in 19... I'm going to miss the date, but it was in the 
late 80s, the American Choral Directors Association honored him at their national convention because of his contributions. And he's one of those people who has kept the spiritual in the forefront and made it part of the choral background and part of the choral history of our country. And it spread to other countries. And Jester is largely responsible for that in this generation.